Hey, it's Kyle here, and we're back in Kerbal Space Program, and it's been about three weeks since the last video. I was hoping we'd have some more information on SLS's launch, but no. So in that time, I've moved house, and Artemis 1 still hasn't been able to get off the launch pad. Now, they did do a bit of a tanking test yesterday, and apparently it was a huge success, aside from, you know, that same leak that stopped the launch. Mm. So we'll come back to those issues going on with the SLS later in the video, but this time we're going to move on to flying Artemis 2 in KSP, as it will likely be 2024 before the real mission gets underway, maybe longer based on the current delays, which is a bit too much of a gap for videos on YouTube it seems. So we're off starting at the astronaut complex and making our first crew. And while we love the plucky crew of Jeb, Val, Bill and Bob, I highly doubt NASA would be happy to have them flying on the SLS. And at this stage, there is no flight crew officially announced for Artemis 2. So I'm creating a crew based on the current astronauts attached to the Artemis program and some educated guesses on who would kind of fit in the role of a lead pilot, a co-pilot, a scientist and an engineer. If you want to make your own Kerbals on PC, hold Control alt and F12 on your keyboard to load up the debug menu and then you can select Kerbal to access the creation menu. Anyway, we'll go through the details of our new Kerbinauts later, but we have Victor and Kate and David for this mission. I know, not very Kerbally names at all. So let's head over to the launch pad and we've got our slightly updated rocket, which you'll see in a little bit, but it's time to check in with our crew who look absolutely terrified. So might as well get this big rocket off the launch pad. Now, Artemis 2's got a bit of a different profile to what we saw on Artemis 1's plan, and there's still a lot which keeps changing because we still haven't had Artemis 1 do its launch. There's a lot about this, but basically it's going to do a multi-translunar injection, so multiple burns, to get a free trajectory back from the moon. So it's only going to be a flyby, they aren't actually going to enter into the orbit of the moon. So we're going to do the same, and this time we're also going to try and copy what we were meant to do in the last video, which was a retrograde orbit to get that nice slingshot back to the planet. Now, Artemis 2 is planned to last for 10 days with that free return trajectory, and part of that is going to be going into a high orbit around Earth before then launching into that lunar orbit. So our launch orbit is meant to be 185.2 kilometers by 2,861 kilometers, which when we convert that to Kerbal, which is a scale of 1 to 10, that's 18.5 kilometers by 286.1 kilometers. Now, uh, for the eagle-eyed, you might realize that's too low to be considered an orbiting Kerbal. We need to be above ideally 70 to actually have a decent orbit. This is just the initial burn and when we get to the apoapsis of that orbit, as we'll do shortly, the whole point is to then burn into a high orbit, 286 kilometers by 2810 kilometers in Kerbal. The ICPS will separate and it too will burn into a retrograde lunar escape orbit to deploy CubeSats along its way. Now with Orion, it's going to go into this high Earth orbit with a period of roughly 42 hours. And I had to do some maths to figure out what that was going to be, but once it's converted into Kerbal time, that's an orbital period of 4 hours and 12 minutes. And from there we could figure out the height of the 2810 kilometers. If you're wondering why it's going to be a 42 hour orbit and a two burn program, apparently NASA arrived at this for a few reasons. Firstly, the higher orbit reduces the amount of propellant Orion's main engine will need to burn by roughly a thousand pounds, that's about 450 kilos for us metrics, which gives plenty of wiggle room in case they need to abort after a TLI. As for the ICPS, that's going to be doing the bulk of the lifting, and it definitely makes sense to use up its resources over Orion's, seeing as it's going to be disposed of. It does also mean that the actual burn won't be in the middle of the crew's sleep cycle, which is another plus, you know, having a rested and alert crew. During that 42 hour orbit, there are a few things which are up for question. There are going to be 24 hours of that to check out the craft and make sure it does what it's meant to do. And they'd also allocated a couple of hours to do orbital proximity demonstrations for docking capabilities. Now, this isn't on the new plan for Artemis 2. And what they were going to do was use the ICPS, the big rocket part that is the stage before Orion, as an object to use for station keeping. So they were going to separate from the ICPS, go up, down, left, right, forward and back from the ICPS using Orion's maneuvering thrusters just to make sure that Orion, if it needed to dock with something on the next flight, it did have those capabilities and there wasn't anything wrong with how they'd come up with their system for those maneuvering thrusters. 
Why this part of the mission is no longer being shown on these infographics for the mission plan, I'm not sure, but I'm sure we'll find out a bit more about it as we get closer to Artemis 2 in 2024 and they then reveal what the whole plan is. It might be they just removed it to make it seem a little more simple, but at this point, everything is subject to change. Well, back to the actual flight on the screen in Kerbal, and we are doing a high orbit burn so that we can then run through all of those checks that need to be done. And that, of course, includes doing that orbital proximity test. Uh, we're going to do it anyway, because that's what we do here. If it's on the official mission plan, or at least was at some stage, it seems likely that it will be on the main one. And I guess it's probably time we introduce you to the crew, because these crews are all based on real astronauts who are going to potentially be flying as part of the Artemis program. Program. First up, we've got our lead pilot and commander, Victor, who is based off US Navy test pilot Victor Glover. Victor Ike Glover has a wealth of experience in flying test vehicles and has already been in the space as a pilot, flying as the pilot and second in command on the SpaceX Crew-1 mission to the ISS in 2020. Glover's call sign is Ike, a name given to him by one of his first commanding officers in the Navy, standing for I know everything. And apparently he does know quite a lot based on the amount of degrees he has. Back to Kerbal, and we've separated from the ICPS and we're now conducting those series of orbital proximity demonstrations for docking capabilities. So we're just burning backwards, forwards, rotating around and showing that we can indeed station keep around the spent module. Back to our crews, our co-pilot and second in command for this mission is the badass US Army test pilot Anne McLean. McLean earned her wings as a scout attack helicopter pilot and has flown more than 800 combat hours on 216 combat missions as a pilot in command and air mission commander. McLean flew on the ISS on Expedition 58-59 in 2018 via the Soyuz and also worked as a flight engineer during her 204 days in space. Both McLean and Glover were selected as astronauts in 2018 13 and they have experience training together so I figured this was a good pairing for our commander and pilots with them both having prior space experience and having had to work together. But back to Kerbal, we've completed our translunar insertion burn, and now we're jumping over to the ICPS, which is also doing its own burn. Now, this might seem like a bit of an odd choice, but it's how they've kind of planned out the mission to go. The ICPS's orbit, as you might have spotted, is very different. It's going to use the moon to slingshot into a solar orbit, and during that, it's then going to drop off all these little CubeSats, which we also did on Artemis 1. Now, as it turns out, this secondary payload can actually hold up to 17 of these little CubeSats, but they're only going to be launching 10 on Artemis 1 and Artemis 2 at this stage. Some of these CubeSats are going to look for water, while others are going to focus on some standard science missions, such as mapping the Shackleton Crater or detecting neutrons to see if they've interacted with elemental hydrogen. Back over on the Orion, we're getting ready to head over to our lunar flyby. This lunar or MANA flyby is meant to be at 4,000 nautical miles for Orion, so that's 7,500 kilometers. In the lead up to it, we will do some small TLI correction burns using the auxiliary engine, which we will also do on our way back to Earth, or in our case, Kerbal. We're passing around the backside of the moon, the dark side of the moon, which is really not dark all the time. I blame Pink Floyd for that. Um, so we passed behind the moon, and you might have noticed our Artemis 2 capsule is a little bit different from Artemis 1, and that's because the Artemis 1 capsule I used only had room for three Kerbal Nauts, and this one from a mod actually has room for four while staying in the same sort of footprint. And this seems as good a time as any to let you know about the rest of the crew. Our scientist is the brilliant Dr. Kate Rubens, and she's the only crew member without one of these new official dandy photos. And based on when NASA first listed the website with these photos, she was in orbit. I went with this epic one of her in the ISS's cupola, which I've been saying wrong my entire life until now, it seems. Dr. Rubens is a microbiologist and has extensive experience studying viruses. She joined the astronaut corps in 2009 and first went into space in 2016 for ISX Expedition 4849 via a Soyuz. She was the first person to sequence DNA in space and grow heart cells in orbit as part of over 275 experiments. She flew again on Expedition 6364 in late 2020 and was the flight engineer for that expedition as well. And last but not least is our engineer, and he's a Canadian. David St. Jakes is from the Canadian Space Agency, CSA, and he's been involved in the design and commission of several telescopes along with astrophysics research, and he joined the ISX Expedition 5859 in 2018, also travelling up via a Soyuz. 
At the time of this video, he's the only active Canadian astronaut with time in space, which is why I picked him for this mission. I feel like you'd want to have an experienced team doing the shakedown run of a new spacecraft. Now, if you're wondering why Canada has a seat on Artemis 2, well, it's because of a 2020 agreement with NASA. The Canadian government's pledged $1.9 billion to the Lunar Gateway Project. Those funds cover the cost of a seat on Artemis 2 and another mission to the Lunar Gateway. It also covers the development of Canadarm3, the third version of the remote manipulator system that we've seen on the shuttle and the ISS. So when we get to the Lunar Gateway mission, we will be seeing another Canadian astronaut. And during that time we've been rambling about our crew, we've separated and re-entered into the atmosphere, and I guess now's as good a time as any to talk about the latest from the SLS for Artemis 1 launch. On September 21, NASA decided to do a tanking test of the SLS on the pad. The test was designed to confirm that changes such as replacement of seals and a new loading procedure would prevent the hydrogen leaks, and it didn't. They managed to warm the connection umbilical cord to the core stage, and that apparently caused the leak to fall well below the limit of concern which is 4% but it didn't stop it. They then also had another hydrogen leak take place during the pre-press test on the second smaller liquid hydrogen line. Engineers kept doing that test and the leak eventually went away over time. So NASA said the conclusion of the test is that they met all their objectives but they didn't say it was good to go for the next launch opportunity of September 27th. So for Artemis 1 I think we could be waiting until October for an actual launch date which is a bit of a shame. But that is the nature of rocket science. It isn't easy and it does not accept people being careless. Unless you're a space frog. And that brings our little video to the end. Thank you to everyone who subscribed after the last video and watched through and gave me a thumbs up. It's greatly appreciated. I'll work on the Artemis 3 video now and see what we can put together for that because we have to also sort out the launch of the Lunar Gateway. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you on the next pass.